It's Monday, October 24th, with 15 days before the midterm elections. President Biden on the campaign trail again today. He slams Republicans' economic plan, should they win control of the House and the Senate, and warns that they intend to take an axe to Social Security and Medicare. Look, folks, Democrats are going to protect Social Security and Medicare. Republicans have been very clear. They've stated boldly that they want to cut Social Security and Medicare. And to the point that they'll shut down the government, they say, and send the nation into default, which raises price for everyone if we do not cut Social Security and Medicare. I ain't going to do it. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas temporarily blocks a judge's order requiring Senator Lindsey Graham to testify to a grand jury in Georgia in a criminal investigation into whether then-President Trump and his allies unlawfully tried to overturn the 2020 election results in the state. Thomas's wife, Ginny, was intimately involved in such efforts. Russia issues a warning that Ukraine is preparing to use a dirty nuclear bomb in its war with Moscow. Ukraine and the West deny it and counter that it may actually be what the Russians have planned. The Department of Justice announces that two suspected Chinese intelligence officers have been charged with attempting to obstruct the criminal investigation of Chinese tech giant Huawei. Attorney General Merrick Garland says they were trying to get inside information on the case. Defendants paid a bribe to the double agent to obtain non-public information, including files from the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District. They did so in the hope of obtaining the prosecution strategy memo, confidential information regarding witnesses, trial evidence, and potential new charges to be brought against the company. Nurses at three East Bay hospitals go on strike over what they say are persistent patient care issues at the Sutter Health-owned medical centers and in the nation's latest mass school shooting. A armed former student breaks into a St. Louis high school, fatally shooting a teacher and a teenage girl and wounding seven others before police kill him from Pacifica Radio. KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles. This is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Rolling Stone magazine is reporting that in recent months, Donald Trump has convened a series of in-person meetings and conference calls to discuss laying the groundwork to challenge the 2022 midterm election results. The magazine cites four people familiar with the conversations, which they say pro-Trump groups, attorneys, Republican Party activists, and MAGA diehards have been discussing the type of scorched-earth legal tactics they could deploy. The magazine says they've been playing out scenarios for what to do if a winner is not declared in a particular race on election night. If there's any hint of doubt about the winners, the Trump forces plan to wage aggressive count campaigns court campaigns and launch a media blitz. Trump himself did this on election night in 2020, when, with the race far from decided, he went on national television to declare that he had won the election. Trump has been briefed on plans in multiple states and critical races, but he's reportedly most interested in the Senate contest in Pennsylvania between Democrat John Fetterman and the Trump-endorsed Republican contender may met Oz. If the Republican does not win by a wide enough margin to trigger a speedy concession from Fetterman, or if the vote tally is close on or after election night in November, Trump and other Republicans are ready to prepare to wage a legal and activist crusade against the, quote, election integrity of Democratic strongholds like Philadelphia. 
Trump's focus on Pennsylvania, the magazine says, seems to be more about his own political future as he's been laying the groundwork for a run in 2024, where Pennsylvania again promises to be a critical and competitive state. The magazine says one source who has spoken to Trump several times about a potential post-election day legal battle over Oz Fetterman puts it, Trump views a potential midterm challenge as a dress rehearsal for Trump 2024. Nadia Ramlagan has more. In order to make our country successful, safe, and glorious again, I will probably have to do it again. Former President Donald Trump told supporters at a Saturday rally in Texas he'll likely run for president in 2024. Trump also continues to spread 2020 election fraud conspiracy theories. Liz Cheney is criticizing Republicans who campaign for election deniers. The Wyoming Republican congresswoman called it indefensible to back claims that the last presidential election was stolen. No one uh, of any party should be voting for people who are election deniers. They're telling you that they'll only certify an election they agree with. Meanwhile, the Trump Organization goes on trial for tax fraud in New York today. The real estate company is accused of helping top executives dodge taxes on rent-free apartments and luxury cars. Trump has called the case a political witch hunt. In Arizona over the weekend, the Maricopa County Elections Department reported two armed individuals in tactical gear and masks watching over a mail-in ballot drop box in Mesa. Arizona Republican candidate for governor Carrie Lake has been attacking the integrity of mail-in early and absentee voting. Our Constitution says election day. It doesn't say election season, election month. And the longer you drag that out, the more fraught with problems there are. Repeated and extensive investigations have found no basis for election fraud claims in the state. And two voters have just filed complaints of voter intimidation to Democratic Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs. Hobbs is Lake's opponent in the race for governor. A recent survey by media outlet The Grio and the Kaiser Family Foundation found inflation and the rising cost of housing are the top economic concerns for black voters. But Temple University professor Mark Lamont Hill says voting suppression continues to be a top issue. Seven in 10 black voters are worried about voter suppression interfering with a fair and accurate election in their state says something significant. 46 percent say they've had to wait in long lines uh, to vote in the past. Tells you a lot about the experience of black voters. I'm Nadia Ramlagan for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The campaign manager for the Republican Arizona candidate for governor is drawing backlash for a tweet that included an illustration of a bloody ancient human sacrifice, along with the words, Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Daniel Montoyo reports. The Arizona Mirror reports Colton Duncan, who works for Republican candidate Carrie Lake, posted the image October 10th of a bygone ritual by Mesoamerican civilization that lived nearly 2,000 miles away. Lake had previously described Duncan as the most important person on her campaign. The tweet went largely unnoticed until a Democratic lobbyist and campaign consultant called attention to it. Native leaders condemned the tweet and are calling for a public apology from Lake. Gila River Indian Community Governor Stephen Rowe Lewis called it racist garbage and says, quote, Arizona's native peoples deserve better. National Committee Woman for the Arizona Democratic Party, Debbie Nez Manuel, who is Navajo, says the tweet is inexcusable. Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes. For National Native News, I'm Daniel Montano. In the past few years, the nation's LGBTQ community has watched hard-won rights suffer relentless attacks across the country. Many fear the worst is yet to come based on the outcome of the midterm elections. Roz Brown has that story. From Florida's so-called don't-say-gay legislation to approved investigations of parents of transgender use in Texas, states have passed laws to undermine the rights of countless Americans. Equality New Mexico Director Marshall Martinez says the outsized reaction is frightening. We're sitting in, from what I can tell, one of the most dangerous times for LGBTQ people since the 60s and earlier. In terms of attacks and folks feeling like they have to go back into the closet and young people facing 
mental health crises. In overturning constitutional protections for abortion, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas suggested the court should also look at the 2015 case that legalized gay marriage. In New Mexico, Democratic Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, who has consistently advocated for LGBTQ rights, faces Republican Mark Ronchetti, a former TV weatherman, on next month's ballot. Ronchetti does not address gay rights on his website and has not shared his views publicly. Martinez feels, at a minimum, such candidates don't think the LGBTQ community is important enough to talk about. Or worse, they don't want their views known. We think that LGBTQ folks in New Mexico deserve to know where the candidates stand on our issues. And we're clear where this governor stands, but we have no idea where her opponent stands. Martinez believes with people just coming out of the pandemic and now struggling with economic issues, many want someone to blame. And the LGBTQ community is a convenient target. And I think that it is easy to scapegoat, especially LGBTQ folks and the teachers and guidance counselors who are supporting us. And this creates an opportunity for people to be distracted from what's really making their lives difficult. This is Roz Brown, New Mexico News Connection. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is fiercely defending his response to the COVID-19 pandemic and his focus on divisive cultural issues in his first and only re-election debate tonight. Democrat Charlie Crist is accusing his Republican rival of being distracted by his national political ambitions, suggesting DeSantis was already focused on running for president. Crist pressed DeSantis tonight on whether he would commit to serving out his second full four-year term. DeSantis did not directly answer the question. He attacked Chris as a close ally of President Biden, whose popularity is sagging in Florida and across the country. In that race for governor in Florida, a Democratic nominee, Democratic nominee Charlie Chris picked the top teachers union representative in the state's largest public school district as his running mate. Tramel Gums reports. Carla hernandez Matz is a special education teacher and first-generation American-born to Honduran immigrants. Despite being well-known in education circles, her pick as a running mate is seen as a wild card, according to Dr. Susan McManus, a political science professor at the University of South Florida. The difficulty is that she's just not getting a lot of exposure and people don't know who she is. And she may be well-known down in South Florida, but she's not well-known in the rest of the state. However, teachers are rallying to change that and think her background will impress the large Hispanic voting bloc in the state. McManus says that tactic worked for Governor Ron DeSantis when he picked Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez. Education issues such as parental rights, school boards, and teachers' unions have become a focus in the race between DeSantis and Christ. Ingrid Robledo taught advanced placement Spanish and worked with Hernandez Mats for many years, even through her three terms as president of United Teachers of Dade. Robledo says fellow educators are excited that a teacher could represent them in the governor's office and touts Hernandez Mats as a leader. She has an active role when it comes to activism and uh, you know solving problems. So. It is true that there is a segment of this community that may not know her, but at the same token, she is having a personal approach to people. Janice Poirier, president of the Florida Education Association's retiree chapter, describes Hernandez Matz as in it to win it. Since Charlie Chris chose her, I see her more than I see him. She's all over the place. She's visiting all of our local unions. She's visiting the retired local unions, and that's where I see her the most. She's a people person. The Republican Party of Florida didn't waste time in going after Hernandez Matz, labeling her as an extremist and a slap in the face to Florida parents. She attended Miami-Dade Public Schools, earned a bachelor's degree at Florida International University, and a master's degree in business administration from St. Thomas University. If successful, this would be her first time holding public office. This is Tremel Gomes for Florida News Connection.
Biden today went to the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington to give a pep talk to Democratic staff and volunteers with just two weeks to go to the midterm elections. Pamela Estrada reports. Biden is expected to hit the campaign trail more over the next couple of weeks to push his political agenda and drum up support for Democratic candidates. Biden said he plans to travel the country over the next couple of weeks and lay out what he called the very different versions that Democrats and Republicans have for the country. I'm here to deliver what I believe is a closing argument about what we need to do in the next 15 days to make a victory assured and make it clear that this election is a referendum. It's not a referendum, I should say. It's a choice. Everybody wants to make it a referendum, but it's a choice between two vastly different visions for America, significantly different. Democrats are building a better America for everyone, with an economy that grows from the bottom up and the middle out, where everyone does well. Republicans are doubling down on their mega, mega, trickle-down economics that benefits the very wealthy, failed the country before, and will fail it again if they win. For example, Biden said he wants to lower the cost of Medicare fees and prescription drugs, and he needs a Democratic Congress to achieve that. Biden said that a Republican takeover of the House and Senate would lead to setbacks for American families. He said that if Republicans take control of Congress, they will continue to attack a woman's right to choose and same-sex marriage. Biden said that under his tax plan, corporations now pay at least 15 percent of their earnings in taxes. He also said that he and Democrats in Congress want to continue gains in job growth and lower unemployment rates. Biden said if Republicans take control of Congress, they'll go after affordable health care. If they win control of Congress, we'll do the following. Give the power we just gave to Medicare for lower drug packs, for lower drug prices, back to Big Pharma and raise drug prices. No, by, by, by the way, I know this sounds like it's, it's almost like you're making it up, but this is what they're saying. This is what will happen. The 2000 cap on prescription drugs for seniors, gone, gone. $35 a month cap on insulin for seniors that we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, gone. Savings on health care premiums, $800 a year for millions of Americans, the Affordable Care Act, gone. And of course, they're still determined to repeal the entire Affordable Care Act. Biden and former President Obama are scheduled to campaign together in Pennsylvania over the final weekend of the campaign. For KPFA News, I'm Pamela Estrada. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas today temporarily blocked a judge's order requiring South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham to testify to a grand jury in Georgia in a criminal investigation into whether then-President Trump and his allies unlawfully tried to overturn the 2020 election results in the state. Thomas put the case on hold, pending further action from either the justice or the full Supreme Court, on a request from Graham, Republican from South Carolina and a Trump ally, to halt the order for testimony. Graham filed the emergency application to the Supreme Court on Friday after a federal appeals court denied his request to block the questioning. Thomas acted in the case because he is designated by the Supreme Court to handle emergency requests from a region that includes Georgia. Many legal scholars have said Thomas should recuse himself from cases involving Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election because his wife, Ginny, was an activist in that effort. Graham has argued that his position as a senator provides him immunity under the Constitution's speech or debate clause from having to answer questions related to his actions as part of the legislative process. Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis has subpoenaed Graham to answer questions about phone calls he made to a senior Georgia election official in the weeks after the 2020 election. Atlanta-based U.S. District Judge Lee Martin May last month narrowed the scope of questions that Graham must answer from the grand jury, ruling that he is protected from having to discuss investigatory fact-finding that he was engaged in during his calls to state election officials. However, 
the judge said he could be questioned about alleged efforts to encourage officials to throw out ballots or alleged communication with the Trump campaign, and he rejected Graham's bid to avoid testifying altogether. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. Britain's ruling Conservative Party has chosen former finance minister Rishi Sunak to become the country's third prime minister in just seven weeks. As Britain's first person of color to take up residence at 10 Downing Street, Sunak's premiership is an historic one. Ali Barrett reports from London. Finance Minister Rishi Sunak will take over from the outgoing Prime Minister Liz Truss. Labour's Emily Thornbury says there should be an election. What the public are thinking is, why are the Conservatives just stitching this up? Why are we getting yet another Conservative Prime Minister and we get no say in this matter at all? It simply isn't right. They crash the economy, and yet they say, oh, we've got to get rid of that uh, that lot. We'll get a new one, but don't worry about it. No, we have the solutions. They don't have the solutions, and they don't have the mandate. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Ollie Barrett. More from reporter Simon Marks. It is the greatest privilege of my life to be able to serve the party I love and give back to the country I owe so much to. The man who will, on Tuesday, become the UK's next Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, addressed members of the governing but fractured Conservative Party today after becoming the only candidate in the race to succeed Liz Truss, who resigned last week. We now need stability and unity, and I will make it my utmost priority to bring our party and our country together, because that is the only way we will overcome the challenges we face and build a better, more prosperous future. Tomorrow, Liz Truss will depart Downing Street. Mr Sunak will visit King Charles III, formally to accept his appointment and then move in to number 10. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Simon Marks. Ukrainian officials today tried to dampen public fears over Russia's use of Iranian-built drones by claiming increasing success in shooting down the small aircraft. Ukrainians are bracing for less electric power this winter following a sustained Russian barrage on infrastructure, especially energy supplying infrastructure across their country in recent weeks. The head of Ukraine's intelligence service said today that Ukraine's forces have shot down more than two-thirds of the approximately 330 Iranian-made drones that Russia has fired through Saturday. Western allies are widely rejecting Russian claims that Ukraine is planning to use a dirty bomb on its own territory. Russia says Ukraine wants to use a bomb with nuclear materials to spread fallout and then blame Russia. But the U.S. and other allies of Ukraine call the claims a pretext for Russian escalation. Christopher Martinez reports. The Kremlin is amping up its recent claims that Ukraine is planning to nuke itself with a dirty bomb in order to make Russia look bad, a claim the White House was quick to dispute over the weekend. State Department spokesperson Ned Price addressed the issue in his Monday briefing. We're concerned uh, when we hear this type of patently false disinformation emanating from uh, the Kremlin. Uh, We know the Kremlin's track record uh, when it comes to these types of claims. That's what, of course, what uh, is the predicate, uh, what ultimately undergirds our concern. Uh, We reject the transparently false allegation that Ukraine is preparing to use a dirty bomb on its own territory. Price noted Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba's response to the Russian claims. Foreign Minister Kuleba said said, uh, in that statement that he invited the IAEA to, quote, urgently send experts to peaceful facilities in Ukraine, which Russia deceitfully claims to be developing uh, a dirty bomb. And the IAEA uh, has agreed. Secretary Blinken will be meeting later today with uh, Director General Grossi of the IAEA. I imagine this will be uh, a topic of uh, discussion. 
Secretary of State Blinken's meeting with Grossi was closed to the press, but Grossi later announced the IAEA will visit two nuclear locations in Ukraine. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre says the U.S. is looking forward to an IAEA investigation. We welcome uh, this commitment to transparency and the assurance it will provide the international community to the international community. The world will see through any Russian attempt to use this allegation uh, as pretext or for escalation. Over the weekend, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu had made an unusual round of calls to the defense ministers of U.S., Britain, France, and Turkey to claim Ukraine is planning to explode a bomb with radioactive material, a so-called dirty bomb, and blame it on Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, in his Sunday night address to the people of Ukraine, mocked what he calls Russia's telephone carousel, saying the world understands well who is the source of everything dirty in this war. Meanwhile, Russia's ambassador to the United Nations has written a letter to the UN Security Council asking it to take up the issue at its meeting Tuesday. Zelensky, for his part, is telling his people Ukraine will win because, in his words, we fight and work for life. Slava Ukraini. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The warning of a Ukrainian dirty bomb came over the weekend from Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu to his British, French, Turkish, and U.S. counterparts. A dirty bomb uses explosives to scatter radioactive waste in an effort to sow terror. Such weapons don't have the devastating destruction of a nuclear explosion, but could expose broad areas to radioactive contamination. Russian authorities today doubled down on Shoigu's warning. Lieutenant General Igor Karilov, the head of the Russian military's Radiation Chemical and Biological Protection Forces, said Russian military assets were on high readiness for possible radioactive contamination. He told reporters a dirty bomb blast could contaminate thousands of square kilometers. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said today, It's not an unfounded suspicion. We have serious reasons to believe that such things could be planned. KPFA's Brian Edwards Teekert asked John Pfeffer, Director of Foreign Policy and Focus, about the Russian claim. This is an opportunity for Russia to kind of, you know, seize what it perceives to be the upper ground. Um, In other words, uh, it's not just Russia that is um, standing accused of uh, perpetrating, you know, these horrendous crimes, but Ukraine as well. But as you said, the the key clause in in what you said is uh, without any evidence. I mean, the Russian government hasn't even bothered to marshal any proof that Ukraine is preparing a dirty bomb attack, has the capability of launching a dirty bomb attack. Um, it, it seems like something pulled out of thin air. What, what's the significance of these uh, peer-to-peer Secretary of Defense calls? Uh, Sergei Shoigu on, on the phone with Lloyd Austin twice in three days. Well, I think there's considerable concern uh, uh, among Biden administration officials that Russia will do something um, unpredictable uh, and that it's necessary to convey that the United States will um, respond um, uh, accordingly uh, in an effort to deter Russia from doing anything that it may or may not do. Uh, so I think this is you know, an opportunity to communicate uh, that as directly and as forcefully as possible. On top of the suspicions and the accusations from both sides about the other side detonating a dirty bomb, there are likewise mutual accusations about intentions to destroy a major bomb in the Kursan region that would have immediate and catastrophic consequences for civilians in the area. Ukraine has pointed to the likely attack on the dam as part of Russia's increasing use of attacks on civilian infrastructure. 
The Kakhovka hydroelectric power plant, which spans the Dnipro River in the southern port city of Nova Kakhovka, is a particularly sensitive target. According to the Institute for the Study of War, Russian forces are expected to attack the dam as part of their withdrawal from Kherson and then pin responsibility on Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said attacking the dam will cause severe flooding to populated areas along the Dnipro River, including the city of Kherson itself. It could also seriously jeopardize the functioning of the embattled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is Europe's largest and depends on water from Kafakova plant to cool the nuclear fuel. Russia says it's Ukraine that's planting, planning to strike the dam. John Pfeffer of Foreign Policy in Focus. First uh, note that uh, it, is, it would be entirely self-defeating for either side to completely destroy the Kachovka dam. Um, it would be self-defeating for the Ukrainians because it would uh, complicate their efforts to retake Kherson and the area around Kherson because, of course, there'd be all this water and they would not be able to you know, advance. I would, you know, probably the, the estimate would be a couple of weeks of delay, but still important. Um, it's not in the Russian interest to completely destroy the dam either because the dam basically supplies water um, to Crimea, and without that water, Crimea is really in serious trouble uh, in terms of uh, accessing water. Um, so uh, the possibility might be that uh, Russia only partially destroys the dam. In other words, destroys it enough to give the, their troops a little bit more um, lead time to retreat, to exit Kherson, um, but doesn't completely uh, rule out water supply to Crimea, um, as well as the water supply to the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant. So this is a key dam. This is a key waterway. Um, uh, it, As I said, it doesn't make sense for either side to to completely destroy it, but we might see something along the lines of a partial destruction by the Russians um, to serve their their interests as they find their position in and around Kherson to be uh, increasingly um, uh, under siege. It has um it, it has already been somewhat damaged by artillery strikes from Ukraine, but that's damage to the roadway that runs over the top of the dam. No. According according to everyone on scene, uh, no structural damage to the dam itself. That's correct. Um, and you know this uh, it, the the kind of narrative around this dam really speaks to the core problem in covering this war. Um, both sides have accused the other of you know attacking the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant of uh of you know killing civilians in the Donbass region um so accusations have been traded on both sides and obviously as we've talked about every week uh there is a lack of information uh that is available that could give us a precise picture of what's going on in Ukraine, especially in those parts of Ukraine that uh, are currently in war uh, conditions. So, you know, the, the, I should also add that, uh, as I think you suggested, um, the Russian accusation that the Ukrainians are planning a dirty bomb attack is possibly preparation for uh, the Russians to partially destroy the dam and blame it on the Ukrainians. Um, and so there again, we have kind of uh, accusations that feed into other accusations as part of, you know, a, a kind of uh, narrative campaign by both sides, but primarily by Russia, which is, you know, really, you know, scrambling at this point to preserve its position in southern Ukraine. 
John Pfeffer directs foreign policy and focus for the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. He spoke with Brian Edwards Teekert of the Upfront Program. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle. The Eurozone is almost certainly entering a recession, with surveys today showing a deepening cost-of-living crisis and a gloomy outlook that is keeping consumers wary of spending. Rosie Burchard reports from Brussels. The steepest decline was recorded in Germany, fueled by what S&P Global describes as steep and accelerated rates of contraction in the country's manufacturing and services sectors. The overall incidence of supply chain delays did, however, fall to the lowest level in just over two years in the month of October, with Eurozone firms reporting fewer shortages and improved shipping. Rosie Burchard, Brussels. In this country, people who receive Social Security payments are eager to see the new cost of living adjustment be applied. It should kick in at the end of the year. The highest increase in decades comes as many beneficiaries are struggling to get by. Mike Moen reports. This month, the Social Security Administration announced a COLA increase of 8.7% for 2023. That's about an extra $145 a month on average. Nancy Cook, a retiree from the Milwaukee area, says the payments are all she and her husband have in terms of income, which makes it difficult to keep up with inflation. It's been really tough. I didn't expect it would be so hard, but it's been really hard. There have been times when we've run out of food money and it's like, okay, what do we do for the next two weeks? She says the extra money will help immensely, but budgeting will still be a challenge. Some Republicans in Congress have floated reforms viewed as a way to trim the program. They argue fixes are needed as more people in an aging population sign up for payments. But opponents, including AARP, say a bipartisan approach is needed to protect Social Security and make it stronger. Cook says the broader public needs to understand just how vital the program is to many older Americans who don't have a retirement nest egg. I don't know what they think people will do without it, because we're not the only couple in the world that live on Social Security alone. Overall, there are more than 65 million Social Security beneficiaries. Meanwhile, older Americans are getting some more good financial news. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced a decrease in Medicare Part B premiums and deductibles. Mike Moen, Wisconsin News Connection. The U.S. Department of Justice today charged 13 Chinese intelligence agents in three cases for trying to blackmail steel and or interfere in U.S. technology innovations and or criminal investigations. The multi-pronged cases, according to FBI Director Christopher Wray, are about China's attempts to dominate world technology. Each of these cases lays bare the Chinese government's flagrant violation of international laws as they work to project their authoritarian view around the world, including within our own borders. We also see a coordinated effort across the Chinese government to lie cheat and steal their way into unfairly dominating entire technology sectors. And in our cases today, we've got yet another example, their attempted obstruction of an independent judicial process to give underhanded help to one of their companies accused of breaking our intellectual property laws and deny justice to that company's victims. That case involves alleged interference into an investigation of tech giant Huawei. Two suspected Chinese intelligence officers have been charged. One of the defendants paid about $61,000 for information on the case to a U.S. government official who was actually an FBI double agent, Attorney General Merrick Garland. They did so in the hope of obtaining the prosecution strategy memo confidential information regarding witnesses, trial evidence, and potential new charges to be brought against the company. The double agent provided the defendants with documents that appeared to present some of the information they sought. In fact, the documents were prepared by the U.S. government for the purpose of this investigation 
and did not reveal actual meetings, communications, or strategies. Huawei and the Chinese embassy in Washington did not respond to today's events. Huawei has previously called the federal investigation political persecution. And in 2020, the company said in a statement that attacking Huawei will not help the U.S. stay ahead of the competition. In another case, in New Jersey, the U.S. charged four people of being Chinese agents who conspired for a decade, posing as a Chinese educational institution with the goal of obtaining U.S. technology information and equipment. Garland says to achieve their objective, the agents also went after activists. They also included attempts to stop protected First Amendment activities, protests here in the United States, which would have been embarrassing to the Chinese government. And in the third case, seven people were charged, two of them arrested, Garland says, as part of the People's Republic of China's fox hunt program to find Chinese dissidents abroad and force them to return to China to face prosecution. Garland says in one instance, the agents harassed a Chinese-American citizen (laughs) with frivolous lawsuits and used family members to urge their return to China while showing up at relatives' homes. The government of China sought to interfere with the rights and freedoms of individuals in the United States and to undermine our judicial system that protects those rights. They did not succeed. The Justice Department will not tolerate attempts by any foreign power to undermine the rule of law upon which our democracy is based. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland As Asian Americans continue to face discrimination and hate crimes, new funding could aid New York officials in reporting and preventing these kind of incidents. Edwin Vieira reports. The multipurpose funding from the Bureau of Justice Assistance will be used to create grants to help community groups in New York City educate people about Asian American culture. The hope is to alleviate some of the tension that has grown since former President Donald Trump dubbed COVID-19 the China virus. Kalea An Mendoza with the group Nonviolent Peace Force says Asian Americans need time to process what has gone on. We haven't had a chance to pause. We haven't had a chance to heal. I think we are constantly put into a state of hypervigilance. I think that there needs to be dedicated spaces for us in our communities to be able to recognize the trauma that we have experienced. He hopes people can work to create a safer and more equitable world and says this mindset needs to be part of the immediate response to the violence. According to Stop AAPI Hate, over 11,000 hate crimes have been reported in the last two years. On a state level, Mendoza says he'd like to see this dealt with as a public health issue, with more resources for developing holistic public safety practices for Asian Americans. On a federal level, his organization wants to see more cooperation between local and national advocacy groups and a more robust dialogue on how to keep people safe. It's important for us to be able to listen to what the direct needs around safety are and to be able to tailor and support and provide the resources, whether that's through trainings, whether that's through advisement or supporting the safety infrastructure. Until people are better able to address the root causes of racism, Mendoza is worried that little change will occur. But Congress passed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act last year to expedite the review of hate crimes and hate crime reports. I'm Edwin J. Vieira, New York News Connection. Nurses today went on strike at three Alta Bates Summit Medical Center campuses in the East Bay over what they say are persistent patient care issues at the Sutter Health-owned medical centers. KPFA's Avery Luke reports. Union nurses with the California Nurses Association issued a 10-day strike notice to Sutter Health administrators. The union says the decision to strike comes after more than a year of negotiations with the not-for-profit hospital chain reached loggerheads. Ann Gabler is a registered nurse in the neonatal care unit at Alta Bates, Berkeley. She's been with the hospital for 40 years. This is not something that we take lightly. It's not a choice that anybody really wants to make. 
but sometimes it takes removing yourself from the workplace to get the point across that, that what we need is to take care of the nurses so that the nurses can take care of the patients. Gabler says Altabate's poor labor conditions have led to a 50% turnover at the hospital, which is higher than the national average. Under a 2017 state law, healthcare employers are required to create methods to deal with incidents of violence in the workplace. In August 2021, the California Division of Occupational Safety and Health fined Sutter for several violations, including failing to have an appropriate workplace violence prevention plan in place at its facilities. Nurses say they still haven't seen a workplace violence plan. Donna Woodrow is a psychiatric nurse at Alta Bates Herrick campus. While walking the picket line there, she said violence towards nurses has increased since the pandemic. And we just need to be, you know, know that we can go to work and be safe and that we can have proper staffing to take care of our patients. That's a big thing. Nurses, we're working like we're just being pulled in so many directions and patient care suffers for that. Sutter Health said in a statement that the strike is costly and disruptive. The statement went on to say that local nurses' union leadership has made it clear they are willing to put politics above patients and the nurses they represent. The statement said the strike was called despite the intervention of federal mediators and Sutter's willingness to bargain in good faith. Alta Bates Berkeley nurse Donna Woodrow says nurses have had to routinely work over overtime because of the high turnover rate, which has impacted the quality of patient care. We take care of people that we need to be taken care of so that we can take care of our patients and our community. And, and that emergency room over there at Alta Bates is in, important to Berkeley. You know, that hospital is important to Berkeley. So just trying to serve the community, trying to do a good job and serve the community. The union said the strike is expected to last until Saturday morning. For KPFA News, I'm Avery Luke. And this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now!, right here on KPFA. Today is the last day to register to vote for the November 8th midterm elections in California. Although voters can still use the same-day voter registration process in person at the elections office or in any in-person voting location, even on Election Day itself, you can register to vote tonight by midnight at online at register to vote dot ca dot gov. Governor Gavin Newsom, State Senator Brian Dolly held the only debate between the two gubernatorial candidates last night before the November election. The Democratic governor is expected to win a second term against the Republican farmer from rural Northern California. Dolly said Newsom, though, is more focused on national office than in working on the state's problems. Californians are suffering. They're fleeing California. They're going to other states uh, where he's campaigning nationally. Newsom said he's committed to a full four-year term if re-elected. Said he's taken stands on national issues because it affects California. And I've barely been out of state. I was out of state for a few hours to take on his party. And his leader of his party, Donald Trump, who he was a passionate supporter of, and what they're doing to democracy. The debate was hosted by KQED in San Francisco. It marked one of the few times Newsom has even acknowledged his opponent's existence since the contest began. Candidates clashed on gas prices, homelessness, inflation, and abortion rights, among other issues. 
An armed former student broke into a St. Louis high school this morning, warning you are all going to die before fatally shooting a teacher and a teenage girl and wounding seven others before police killed him in an exchange of gunfire. The attack after just 9 a.m. at Central Visual and Performing Arts High School forced students to barricade doors and huddle in classroom corners, jump from windows, and run out of the building to seek safety. One terrorized girl said she was eye-to-eye with the shooter before his gun apparently jammed and she was able to run out. Speaking at a news conference this afternoon, Police Chief Michael Sack identified the shooter as 19-year-old Orlando Harris, who graduated from the school last year. Sack said the motive is still under investigation, but there's suspicions that there may be some mental illness that he's experiencing. Investigators later searched Harris's home. Authorities did not name the victims, but the St. Louis Post-Dispatch identified the dead teacher as Jan Kukska. Chief Sachs said the other fatality was a 16-year-old female who died at the school. Seven other 15- and 16-year-old students, four boys, three girls, were all in stable condition. Four students suffered gunshot wounds or graze wounds. Two suffered bruises. One had a broken angle. Sack declined to say how Harris was able to get into the building, which has security guards, locked doors, and metal detectors. Sack said Harris had the gun out when he arrived at the school, and there was no mystery about what was going to happen. Harris had nearly a dozen high-capacity magazines of ammunition with him, Sack said. That's a whole lot of victims. It's certainly tragic for the families, and it's tragic for our community, but he said it could have been a whole lot worse. St. Louis School Superintendent Kelvin Adams said seven security guards were in the school at the time of the attack, each stationed at an entrance of the locked building. One of the guards noticed the gunman trying unsuccessfully to get in at a locked door. The guard notified school officials who contacted police. Sachs said the call about a shooter came in about 9, 11 a.m. Officers arrived and had Harris down. Fifteen minutes later, he and others praised the quick response of officers and other emergency responders at the scene. A former Minneapolis police officer has pled guilty to aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter in the killing of George Floyd, just as jury selection was to get underway in his case. J. Alexander King today agreed to a deal that calls for three and a half years in prison, with prosecutors agreeing to drop a count of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. He's the second officer to plead guilty to the state charge following Thomas Lane, a third former officer, Tu Thao, rejected a plea deal earlier this year. He agreed today to waive a jury trial, go through an uncommon process in which he'll agree to the evidence against him on the manslaughter charge before the judge issues a verdict. Authorities in Wisconsin and Michigan have now signed off on the Menominee Indian Tribes nomination of a site to the National Register of Historic Places. That's drawn backlash from some who support mineral exploitation of the land, calling it a veiled attempt to stop the Black 40 gold mine there. Daniel Keating reports. Historic preservation boards in Wisconsin and Michigan have approved the nomination of Onam Omat. The site includes the 60 Islands area where the tribe once lived on the Menominee River. Menominee tribal chairman Ron Korn Sr. says it contains the tribe's dance rings and burial mounts. We're trying to protect our historic and cultural places. We're trying to protect, you know, the resting place of our ancestors. It's also where Gold Resource Corporation wants to mine gold and other metals for the Back 40 project. Michigan Republican and State Senator Ed McBroom says listing the site would add more hurdles to the permitting process. Suddenly, they're only up here to stop this mine, and this is just their latest uh, trick in the bag to do so. Corrin says the tribe is opposed to the mine, but insists the nomination is about protecting cultural resources. A mining company executive says they will avoid disturbing archaeological sites. For National Native News, I'm Danielle Kading. 
a popular fishing site on the Columbia River for the Yakima Nation, has been listed as a Superfund site by the federal government. Eric Tegatoff reports. Toxins near Bonneville Dam at a place called Bradford Island prompted the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to put the area on the national priority list in March. Laura Kreisner Shira is an environmental engineer with the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program. She says the area near Bradford Island is a toxic soup for resident fish, with chemicals like PCBs among the most hazardous. The take home when you start to look at all the individual effects of each of these chemicals or chemical groups is that it really affects multiple systems, it affects multiple organs, it can cause cancer, it's especially harmful to small children, fetuses, and immune and thyroid compromised persons. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dumped electronics near the island for decades, leading to the current toxic situation. People are advised not to eat non-migratory fish up to a mile from the dam. Shira says Yakima Nation took the lead in calling for Bradford Island to be placed on the national priority list, with the states of Oregon and Washington backing up those calls. It was very important to have NPL listing because we thought that it could lead to a more protective cleanup. But we also realized that with NPL listing, it's going to require a lot of work still. Shira says despite their leadership, the Yakima Nation has been cut out of recent discussions on cleanup. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says the process has to go through regulators first, including the states, EPA, and Army Corps, but is inviting the public to be involved after that. She says this is discouraging because it's an ancestral site for tribal members, where fishing has gone on since time immemorial. Shira also notes that fishing continues there, making cleanup a pressing issue. A lot of members aren't going to change their diet because of a fish advisory, or they might accidentally catch a resident fish, and their culture teaches them that every fish is a gift from the creator. I'm Eric Tegadoff reporting. A California judge has ruled in favor of a bakery owner who refused to make wedding cakes for a same-sex couple because it violated her Christian beliefs. The State Department of Fair Housing and Employment had sued Tastry's Bakery in Bakersfield, arguing owner Kathy Miller intentionally discriminated against the couple in violation of California's civil rights law. Miller's attorneys argued her right to free speech, freedom of religion, trumped the argument that she violated the law. Superior Court Judge Eric Bradshaw ruled on Friday that Miller acted lawfully. The couple, Eileen and Maria Rodriguez del Rio, said they will appeal that verdict. Longtime KPFA events producer Bob Baldock died this weekend of congestive heart failure. He was 85 years old. Bob Baldock organized talks and other events for station benefits for more than 20 years, inviting figures like Alice Walker, Howard Zinn, Eduardo Galliano, and many others to the stage. Last year, Bob published an autobiographical novel called Wild Green Oranges about his experience as one of the few Americans to fight in the Cuban Revolution in 1958. Bob Baldock was also an artist and a co-founder of the former Black Oaks Books Independent Bookstore in Berkeley. He leaves behind his partner, Kathleen Weaver, and four children. KPFA supporter, longtime KPFA events producer, Bob Baldock, dead at the age of 85. Partly cloudy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the mid-60s, a little warmer, highs in the low 70s further inland. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, mostly sunny, highs in the mid to upper 70s. Sunny skies predicted for the Los Angeles area with highs from the mid to the upper 70s there as well. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, October 24th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening.
Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.